If you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, and we'll begin at verse 28. Each of these miracles, you see how Jesus has authority over different realms of life. And this one has to do with the demonic world and the devil himself. Hence, this title, Jesus' Victor over Evil. Again, Matthew 8, 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, uh, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. And they were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And he said, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. I got a story here that I read in one of the writings of Kent Hughes about some people who got a little over-obsessed with demons. Uh, a, a Bible study had started, and a lot of neat things were happening. People, their friends, and so forth were becoming Christians. Marriages were being enriched. Families were being restored. And the church that they were part of was infused with new life. But... Some of the leadership became overly fascinated with the subject of spiritual warfare and took their eyes off Christ to become self-styled experts in demons and exorcism. And I'll just read the rest to you. Things were clearly getting out of hand when one night they became convinced there were demons in the dining room chandelier and ended the Bible study by dissembling the light fixture so each could take part of it and bury it in a different part of the city. The crowning embarrassment to the Christian community came later when one morning some of the children were seen by neighbors running down the street shouting, the devil is going to get us, the devil is going to get us. And responding, the neighbors found the group's women in the backyard hacking a rosewood chest to pieces to dispose of supposed demons. The lesson, he says, if Satan cannot pull you down, he will push you happily over the edge. And that's true, okay? But just the reverse of that is equally damaging, that to have no fear of the devil. Um, we walk a fine line. Uh, we are to be fully aware of the devil and always be walking circumspectly and on the alert. First Peter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but we can't stop there. Because the next verse says, But resist him, firm in your faith. There is a victory that you and I can have. As James says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's James 4, 7. So when it comes to meeting the enemy, we need to bear a couple things in mind. One, that Christ has conquered the enemy in the cross. Yes, the devil is still in the world, but his power has been thwarted and his fate is sure. He knows his judgment is coming. Second thing, we too are more than conquerors in Christ. Our union in him makes us also victors over evil, and that's the big idea here. In his final words to the church, Paul, uh, I'm sorry, his final uh, words to the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul says, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Not Christ, your feet. Feet. What is he saying? Well, Christ crushed the head of Satan on the cross, and that experience will one day be 
ours. But even while we wait, there is a victory we can have in the here and now. We have a certain victory even though the end has not come. In this passage in Matthew, we see a preview of what Christ will do on the cross and the devil's ultimate destruction. The exorcism here is a prelude to the ultimate exorcism. Jesus, therefore, has full authority over demons and the devil. And Jesus' victory is ours as well, at least in part. For we all know that we stumble in many, many ways. But let's first look at this confrontation between these two men, the demons within them, and, and Jesus Christ. Jesus has just calmed the sea. And the response of the disciples is, what kind of man is this? Oddly enough, Jesus will have the demons tell them. They are the ones who know. So they call him by his full title of deity, Son of God. These demons are obviously not followers of Christ, but they certainly know who he is. And as James says in his little epistle, they shudder. When Jesus crosses the sea and gets out of the boat, he encounters two men filled with demons. So um, Jesus enters this area called the area of the Gadarenes. Now, if you know the story from the Gospel of Mark and Luke, you're going to have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I thought that these men were Gerasenes, not Gadarenes. And... Uh, if you've picked up on that, well done. Gadara, and here's the answer, refers to a village, and also the region of which Garessa, another village, uh, was a part of. And so you can think of it this way. I just learned this, it's pretty cool. But you could be from Sauk or Prairie du Sac, or you could be from Sauk City, or you could also be from Sauk Prairie, and you would be correct, okay? That's all that's happening here. That Gadara is an area on which Garissa, uh, Garissa is from, so you could also be a Gerasene. If you're astute, you will also remember that Mark and Luke record only one uh, man, not two. And you'll say, well, why is that? I'll give a couple answers. One is this, that it may very well be that one man became the central character, just like in any story. Just one guy became the central uh, character uh, to uh, tell of Jesus' authority. Uh, this one's a little iffy. Uh, Matthew alone might have had knowledge of the, the second one. I don't know. But just picture it this way. You know, one day you go downtown and you run into a friend that you haven't seen in about three years. And you go home and you, 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 you tell your wife, man, it was just so good to see Tom. But Tom also had a friend with him. You just don't mention him, or if you do, you mention him briefly and in passing, because the important thing was you caught up with your old friend. Now let's move on to a more important thing, and that is the confrontation between these people. Jesus is crossing boundaries again. He is in Gentile territory, hence pigs, and he is either in or alongside a cemetery, the place of the dead, where you could become ceremonially unclean. So Jesus is deliberately invading the domain of darkness. Hence, these demons confront him, and they call him by name. That is a means of confrontation. Um, by the way, it won't be until Matthew 16 that Peter confesses Christ as the Son of God. See, these guys are just still getting it. <laughs> They're just slowly learning. And so the demons know, and they don't quietly get it. But these demons are no match for Christ. They do not intimidate him in the least, nor does their violence scare him. Now you think about this scene. You know, even though this whole scene has this sinister pall of death hanging over it, Jesus is in completely... Uh, completely in charge. The demons know that there was coming a time when they would be eternally punished. They just didn't want it to happen then. Okay? Later than sooner would be better. Now did you notice, as we read this, 
that nothing is said about the disciples, that's because this is all about Christ. And that's why I've taken this tack in this sermon. It's all about Christ. Matthew is telling us that the Son of God has absolute authority over all things. You know, there are a number of lessons that we could take home for ourselves. Uh, each lesson, wonderful lesson in itself. One, that we better know that we battle not against flesh and blood, as the Apostle Paul tells us. We could learn that Jesus is more concerned about people than these farmers and their pigs and their money and worldly goods, and that would be correct. There's a lesson for us all to take uh, home that the gospel must go into areas that are hostile and unwelcoming to us. The main lesson, however, is about Christ, his authority over all principalities. What kind of man is this has to be answered. And that is, victory is also ours. We are sent with his authority, and we cannot live fear-driven lives. Let's talk about the conquering of these demons. Matthew very briefly tells the story. The demons ask to be cast into the pigs, and Jesus says, go. They go into the pigs, and they drown themselves, which leaves us with a couple of questions. The first question is this. Why did the demons ask to be sent into the pigs? Why? Well, you know, one answer is that they desire a bodily home. Well, yeah, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because this bodily home in the pigs is very short-lived. I mean, it's no sooner do they enter these pigs and the, the pigs are uh, dead. Another answer, though, that makes good sense, that the devil is a destroyer and therefore seeks to destroy God's creation. That includes people. That includes people. I think about those poor guys, you know, coming home from the bar or whatever that crashed uh, the other night. A uh, guy has been badly burned. The three, You know, I just go, Satan's a destroyer. He wants to destroy God's creation. Sad. Very good answer. There's another answer, a third one, and that is to stir up animosity toward Jesus. These farmers lost a lot of money that day, and they were very upset about it. But Jesus saw it coming, and therefore he let it happen. The second question we need to ask ourselves is, why did Jesus send the demons into the swine? Well, if you trace the deep or the abyss or the sea throughout Scripture, you'll often see that it's linked with evil. So when God sets up the new heavens and the new earth, uh, we're told, and there is no longer any sea. Evil has been done away with. So it could be that Jesus was sending them right back to where they came from. It's a symbol of his victory. It was momentary because these demons would go and indwell some other lives. But uh, we again get this preview of what is to come, the final victory, and what he's going to do on the cross. Another answer to that is that the stampede dramatized just how free these two men were from their demons. These demons were gone, never to return. They are a picture, if you will, of Jesus' saving power, freeing people from the kingdom of darkness. There's a third answer to this, that is to point out how different Jesus' values are. People are more important than the swine. People are more important than the money. People are more important than anything that the world can ever offer us. And so, as one commentator put it, and I found this quote just about in every commentary that I read, all the ages down has been refusing Jesus because it prefers um, pigs. In the, if the intent of the devils, and this is the fourth answer, if the intent of the devils was to stir up opposition then Jesus made it happen. He didn't proudly say, well, bring it on, nothing like that, but he made it happen. And here we see not just Jews rejecting him, but Gentiles. These Gentiles opposed Jesus. 
In other words, the whole world is in opposition to Jesus, except for a few, except for a few. Much time is spent on the, the demoniac in, in the book of Mark, Mark 5, and he is found, we read, clothed and in his right mind. The demoniac is a picture of the victory saved people find in Jesus. His victory, big idea again, is ours. So if you have a hymn book, and I know I asked you to do this with joy to the world, I've been giving you these assignments, but if you have a hymn book at home, it would really do uh, you well to read A Mighty Fortress is Our God, because Luther's big idea is the big idea here. That's what we're talking about. Finally, Jesus' conquering of these demons is made known. It's revealed or it's declared. And there's two declarations made. First, the herdsmen who lost um, all their uh, pigs. And in a very negative way, they made the miracle made known. They did not like Jesus, and their statement resulted in unbelief and hostility. These people say, you better leave, and you better leave soon. Something, by the way, we need to learn, that we are not always going to be liked. We're not always going to be liked. People are going to be making fun of us in private and so forth. You can't care. But Jesus can use all things for his glory. So even though they rose up against Christ, they witnessed the change that Jesus made in these two lives. So Jesus is in control of all things, and he will use everything for his glory. The second revelation was made by the demoniac himself. We read that in Mark 5, and I'd like to just read to you uh, the story. And their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. They went all over. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion, for there were many in him, they became fright and, uh, and they became frightened. And those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to entreat him to depart from the region. Isn't it interesting? That here they're bearing witness to what Christ has done, but then they want him to leave. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was entreating him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim in Decapolis, that is the ten cities, what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Jesus changes people and we need to be able to share that even in our lives. Though the man wanted to go with Jesus, Jesus told him that he could follow him in his hometown. So he gladly spoke about Jesus. First Peter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I know the chief end of man is to glorify God, that we have been saved to glorify God. But we've also been called to, as Peter says here, declare his excellencies, to not be ashamed and to be excited about sharing Christ. A testimony. And by the way, I love hearing people's testimonies because they're all about God's grace and how he you know, work through all the situations of their life out so that they could come to Christ and, and grow in him and so forth. That testimony involves a couple of things. It tells others how Christ saved us and also the change that he has made. But it, is also, it also includes bearing witness to Christ. You know, if you and I were in a courtroom and we were called to testify, we would bear witness to the truth. And so, we're to bear witness to Christ, who he is, and what he has done. And going back to the beginning, the disciples are not mentioned in this story. It's not about them. 
It's about Christ, or as Peter says, the excellencies of Christ. We're to glory in Christ and find therein the encouragement to speak uh, about him. Then a Christian, I don't know how long, okay? Can't do the math. I've been a Christian for a long, long time. And, you know, somewhere in the way you can kind of lose your enthusiasm. You can kind of lose that first love. You can get uh, kind of sucked, if you will, into life. It has that effect upon us. And so we seem to be less excited about sharing our faith with Christ, you know, uh, to others. And we can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. Why? Because Christ is a big Christ. And his victory over evil is also ours. He sends us out in his authority, and we need to claim it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder. And thank you for Christ. Thank you for the Gospels and how they draw us closer to Christ and remind us of who you have uh, given us. And uh, Father, may we be forever proud of Christ, unashamed to share the gospel. Now we pray in Christ. Amen.